أما بعد فيقول الله عز وجل وما رسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وفي آية أخرى وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم ويقول حسان بن ثابت رضي الله عنه وصفا للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأجمل منك لم تر قط عيني وأجمل منك لم تلد النساء خلقت مبرأ من كل عيب كأنما خلقت كما تشاء respected brothers and whoever else is listening first of all we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling each and every one of us to reach this place and be here right now this in itself is a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we live in a society where the masjid is only an important place occasionally and the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him is only important when things go wrong or his the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him is only remembered in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal First of all, I will also include within that uh, my uh, gratitude to Sheikh Qadi Lutfur Rahman Al Azhari, if I call you, for allowing uh, or for inviting me here. The brothers who are here and whoever else is listening, it's a topic which in itself is an ocean. But I, looking at the audience in front of me, I do not want to offend your intelligence by telling you something you already know. What I would rather do is summarize just one aspect of the word reviver of the dunya. Me and you today are not just us, but the entire world is indebted to the contributions made by the Prophet ﷺ to this entire world. And it's for this reason I selected the first verse. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلَّاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That, O oh Muhammad, we have not sent you for any other purpose except that you are a mercy to the entire universe. I'll give you some examples of what mercy means. Me and you know mercy to be like Allah will make somebody feel happy, they'll be smiling or they'll have peace and tranquility. This is one of the manifestations of mercy. The Prophet ﷺ came to this world when the society was on the edge of destruction. The most educated people around that time were either the Romans on the left or you can say whichever direction from the right and you had the Persians. In the Arabian Peninsula, the people of the book who they used to refer to were the Yahud who had in fact arrived knowing that the last messenger will emerge from this region. The society was so far away from decency, killing, bloodshed. If you talk about scientific research, these are all the problems, and I'm sure you all know this. The last authentic message that had come down to earth was in the form of Isa alayhi salam, which most ulama agree 500 plus years, a gap of 500 plus years before the Prophet ﷺ arrived. They were burying their daughters alive. Women had no recognition, no rights, no status whatsoever. Religion was actually finished. The Europeans were killing away people in the name of religion. The Arabs were in the world. Allah showed you something and showed us something amazing the most deprived region, the most complicated region was in fact Arabia. Sometimes when I say this, if there's an Arab in the audience, they get offended. But it's an honor to be from the Arabs. Now this person, before I go into the details, is born in the most dislocated, disadvantaged part of the world. His father has passed away before he's born. Some years later, his mother passes away. So we know the background. Today, psychologists would say it's a bad childhood. This is, would be their explanation of when somebody does, and they say he's got a bad childhood. There's no stability. 
Now somebody from that type of a background, he was from a noble family, which is an important condition for a prophet. In the words of Michael Hart, I'm sure you've heard of Michael Hart, an American academic who wrote a book which is still available and published everywhere now. The 100 Most Influential People in the History of Mankind. His summary of why Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, happens to be the most successful person is that he's born in a disadvantaged place. He doesn't have any resources. Forget resources, he cannot even write. Not being able to write is also a massive disadvantage. You can't express yourself formally to big people. The Arabs of where he is born in Mecca, the area of Hijaz in particular, killing each other, burying their daughters alive. <coughs> the only people that could have had some guidelines of getting towards decency were people who had some divine, divine books. So we had the people of the book. So the law and order is in a mess. When it comes to education, the system of education, the Europeans were mystifying everything. So they would never ask anyone why and how does a tree function because they would not open up things. The world was a mystery because of some Christianity, Christian philosophy. Some of the world was treated as a divine place. So if something is divine, you don't touch it. You run away from it. You would never open up the tree and ask why and how does the tree function. Dispute resolution is a very big area. So if there's a dispute over wealth, if there's a dispute over between husband and wife, in every society, with full confidence I can say, women were neglected. They had no legal status. In, in, in the European tradition, women were not even recognized as entities. They were like treated as property that you inherit a woman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam achieved what no other human in the history of this world was able to achieve in 23 years. He was not only able to unite people, which is the biggest strategy, but he was also able to produce a society where religion, let me say religion, or practice of religion was tolerated. This is the most controversial of statements. Today, unfortunately, people who do not know the seerah, who do not understand the Quran, we hear of somebody saying something about the Prophet, we go, people go crazy, they want to kill them. Allah knows whether they are the people who really killed them. But in Medina, there were Yahud living there. In fact, the verse which a lot of people quote, La ikraha fid din, that there is no compulsion in Islam. <coughs> A lot of people do not even look into the background behind how this verse was revealed. Amongst the many causes behind the revelation of this verse, one reason given is that the mushrikeen, the mushrikeen, the ones who worship idols, they would put their children in the company of the Yahud to look after them and educate them. When a lot of them embraced Islam and went to Medina, the mushrikeen said, Oh, because you're going Medina and you're become a Muslim, we no longer want you to look after our children. We have the same problem with our schools now. So young children become a threat. They are potential, you know, under this anti-terrorism and extremism law, even young children. So it's a very similar situation in those days. So what happened? They said, oh, these children of ours, which we gave to you to look after, maybe you adopted them, maybe you're looking after them. Why don't you give them back to us? And the people who were looking after them, many of them were Yahud. They embraced Islam and they're now wanting to take them to Medina. Now, what do we do? What does Islam say? What does the Prophet ﷺ do by his practice? He said, no, they must go back to their parents. Which simply means he tolerated Without going into too much detail, because you brothers are, mashallah, learned and you can gain this information online and even through books and through scholars and through seerah programs. The Prophet ﷺ in Medina, 
he laid down the foundations of what you would call a global village. One of the tensions you have, big tensions, till today you have this in this world. Only in the 1960s did America budge on, on that. Uh, it's the area of racial tensions. The tribes of Arabia were vicious. The, 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 the agreements they had, the understanding they had, and how, how, how tightly, um, let's say, they were living in such tight conditions where if one person slipped their tongue and said something or... If even one person's camel happened to drink or were give, give, being given water before the other person, they would fight for six months. In this type of a society, the Prophet ﷺ was able to, through the tawfiq of Allah, remove racial tensions. Bilal of Habasha, who was a slave, was made the Mu'addin. Salman who was a Persian, another slave, was given a status. In fact, his opinion became the decision behind the strategy when they were surrounded by the Mushrikeen of Arabia. Suhaib was another Sahabi who came from Rome. The list is endless. So he brought people from different backgrounds, cultures, languages, skin color together he came out with a legal system that was so just that even the Yahud would run to them for justice. So just that a young lady would come to the Prophet ﷺ and say that my father wants to forcefully get me married. Why does he want to get me forcefully married? Oh, because my father's brother, my father owes money to my uncle, my father's brother. And because he hasn't paid him back, my father is paying him back by getting me married to his brother's son. And I do not want to marry this person. So this woman is coming to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ is giving her a solution. He said, you have a choice to divorce. I mean, not you yourself, but we can nullify this marriage. He is given rights Anyone and everyone to an extent that even animals are getting rights. This always brings me into this point that when you study the uh, hadith or when, when you re read the virtues of seeking knowledge, you, re you come across this well-known hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that when a student leaves his house to seek knowledge, the angels out of honor, they, they lay down their wings. You know, there's some... Kalam, there's some discussion on, 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 on this, this wording. Others, in that same rewire, there is a mention that the fishes in the seas and the oceans, they pray for this person. Praying, some, some rewire mentioned istighfar, they seek forgiveness for this person. Now the question is, why does this hadith deliberately talk about animals and who are, I mean, if I'm seeking knowledge, I'm going to benefit my community. Why would the fish in the sea be bothered about me seeking knowledge? What you have to understand is that the ilm, the knowledge which the Prophet ﷺ has transmitted to this ummah, the nur he has spread to this world, is environment friendly. And because it's environment friendly, the fishes in the sea and the animals around us are impressed. Simple example. Somebody is going to study science or chemical warfare. A fish in Iraq would be worried. <laughs> Why? Because this guy is going to go and invent something so ridiculous and they're going to throw some of these chemicals and kill people. But if a student is going into a desert of Arabia or he's going into a, in, through the Sahara Desert to go somewhere in Mauritania to study Tajweed or you know, again, Ijazah, what, he, what will he come out with? He will come out with the fear of Allah. He will have the choice as the Prophet ﷺ had the choice. In Makkah, when he, when he conquered Makkah, you see my way of talking, when I look at the audience, mashallah, you brothers do seem educated, so I'm going to go back and forth, knowing that you know these things. Yes? And if I am complicated, please stop me, I'll come down to the level. But having Sheikh next to me, I feel I should at least 
you know, consider his presence. Yes. <laughs> so, when the Prophet Sallallahu conquered Mecca, he had full rights to take revenge. But what did he do instead? He said, "La tathriba alaykum al-yawm." He forgave them. During the early days of the Sahaba, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, they had conquered a lot of territory of, Asia, of Persia. One of the Persians raised a complaint that you came and conquered us without giving us da'wah. So what happened? They, the Muslims, when this letter went back to Medina and headquarters and they looked into it, they said, okay, we're going to have to give them the land back and give them da'wah back. Because we didn't follow the procedure. You know, like you have a war that goes wrong, and then they do an investigation, public inquiry, and you have to come and give your evidence. I'm giving brothers example, and anyone else who's listening, examples of how the Prophet wasallam. So there was five areas without me getting carried away. We're talking about racial equality. We're talking about dispute resolution, the law and order of the society. We're talking about religion itself. Within religion, we talk about religious tolerance. See, lately you're all hearing about this anti-terrorism law and you have people going crazy doing khutbahs. And, you know, one, somebody said to me that day that he now translates uh, jihad as tourism. I said, you should be careful. If you say tourism, somebody misspells it. It might become ter <laughs> terrorism. This reminds me of a joke. I do have some humor, if you don't mind me saying when we were, I went to Egypt some years back via Jordan and when you come off Jordan, Sheikh will know that you go through these bus routes they have too many checkpoints I mean the Muslim country has so much security that it's, it makes the word security a threat itself but they kept on stopping us every and they look in the bus and they see oh this guy's got a beard the whole bus, everyone looks fine, the bearded guy come out now at least 10 stops they stopped us, stopped us and one, on one more occasion, I got so tired of saying siyaha. And he, I mean, I'm speaking, trying to speak Arabic to respect the person, but they love to speak English. They ask me, is my English good? So obviously I'll tell every guard, your English is great, you should be in England. <laughs> so he says to me, why are you here? And we were advised to say tourism. On one occasion, I got so upset with the, with the, with the, with the bus, the amount of stops they had. I got so angry, I, it slipped my tongue, I said, I'm here for terrorism. <laughs> and the, the guard is so sloppy, he didn't even realize I said that. He said, thank you very much, carry on. <laughs> so the point I want to make, is the point I want to make, is from the third area, this area is very important, the law and order. When you come under religion, you come under many things. And the world today is struggling to even implement 10% of that. The Prophet ﷺ allowed Yahud to exist in, in Medina, knowing the whole of Baqarah is full of information about their conspiracy. He allowed them to even trade with interest. Shocking. If there was a very extremist type of person who doesn't understand Maslaha and Tadrij, they would say, hang on, how did that happen? He allowed them until they stayed within the boundaries of decency. And... More importantly, the educational foundation is laid down by the He encouraged everybody to seek knowledge. And he also did something which the ulama say was, in fact, he opened the door for research in such a strange way that even till today, people don't know how that happened. We know the famous story when they arrived in Medina, Medina is a very nice agricultural green land. What happened, we all know this well-known story, what they used to do is they used to get the, the date trees and they would mix the male and female roots together to, hope, uh, to, to increase the output of dates. That Birun Nakhla, it's a well-known Arabic term. It's in the hadith, this, this, this entire story. So when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, the, 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 the Ansar of Medina, they used to do this. People living in Medina. So out of, out of just a discussion, they said to the Prophet ﷺ once that we do this. What do you think? Because they wanted to make sure, see he's reforming everything. He's reforming you know, family law, he's reforming the legal system, he's reforming so many things. So therefore, let's ask him and tell him what, what he thinks. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu said to them, why do you do this? He goes, to help increase the output of dates. Number one, he gave them the right to ask him questions. With respect. He said to them, don't do this. It doesn't make any sense to me. They followed his instructions. Strangely, what Allah decided to do, remember the boundary between Tawheed and Risala. A lot of people don't know the boundary before. In Jabil Awal, they go into Tawheed. <laughs> they take the Prophet Sallallahu up there. Then you have to bring them back until Ramadan, back into Risalat. If you know what I mean, brothers. What happened? They, they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, with the greatest of respect, unfortunately, the dates, the output of dates decreased. As humble as he is, the Prophet Sallallahu said. He said, Antum, this statement, they say, is the foundation of scientific research. This, they said this is like the la ilaha illa. This la has stopped, basically made a big point. He said, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You know best about what your worldly experience tells you. Where he's now taken this away. So now, if you have an Islamic state, wherever you have an Islamic state, we're not talking about the Islamic state over there. The Quran does not need to tell you whether you have to have double yellow lines there. If you are doing scientific research, you cannot, the Quran does have its limits. It gives you the hudud and the qudud, the boundaries. But it leaves it to your experience. This is why Sahaba later on did amazing things. Umar ibn Khattab introduced the check, which is called shiq in Arabic. He didn't say, oh, the Prophet never did this, so I'm not going to do this. No. You were given the freedom to interpret things within the boundaries of the Quran and the Sunnah. The point I want to make is that the Prophet Sallallahu not only did he take them out of their misery, he very successfully did three things. The success, this is what you call success. First aspect of those three things is, he did not let the practice of the Anbiya before him, or the tradition of the Anbiya before him, which brings Hajj, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, Sunnah, Musa alayhi salam's efforts, he did not, the Qibla, you see how much compromise he made. Initially the Qibla, they were facing towards Quds. May Allah bring us Quds back. So he, he did not say to the Yahud, you know what, because you've all fabricated your books, you're not important anymore, go home. No. Diplomatically, you can say politically, this is politics. The Quran taught him to acknowledge their presence. After all, a lot of them are the children of Anbiya. After all, they will play a big role in helping Islam. In fact, they prayed in Spain for Muslims to stay in charge because they were under protection. And the oldest churches and synagogues in the, Muslim, in the world are in the Muslim world for this reason. So he acknowledged the past, aspect number one. He took full ijtihad and full understanding of the presence through wahi so he did not arrive in Medina and could declare war on the whole world did he declare war on the whole world unfortunately today's people who say we are the followers of Muhammad they do a YouTube video and declare war, war on the whole world and you launch a missile they'll be the first ones to hide the Prophet ﷺ used his wisdom he has Jibreel there to for immediate communication to Allah. He can go direct to Allah. He did not declare war. Strategically, he used the route of getting people together, giving people a chance. He did something which today's Western world tries to do. It's called charm. They will come to you, they will say, we're here to liberate you from injustice. We're here to take you out of confusion. They will smile with these cameras before them. But behind the scenes you will see drone missiles going down on the ground. And people will die and they'll say this is collateral. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ is Rahmatan lil Alameen. What are his guidelines to his soldiers? If you attack them Islamically, and this is something which the Ottomans did quite well. The Europeans were very upset with the Ottomans. I'm telling you this from the Sira back and forth. I'm not talking about Ottomans just because... I want to, but I want to explain that they followed one adab of Islam taken from the Prophet ﷺ. This is why he's a reformer. On one occasion, one of the Ottoman battalions attacked 
a European, um, as they were going towards, they wanted to take and liberate Quds. So they, they took, um, they attacked them at the wrong time. Islamically, there's guidelines when you attack them. You should attack them when they're ready. What do today's uh, thing? They attack you at night and run away. Navy SEALs, wherever they are. If, during warfare, you can't attack anyone who's a non-combatant. So children, elderly people, women. You can't even use fire to punish anyone. The hadith is la tu, la tu bin nar, Which will put a lot of people into trouble with all these... So there's guidelines for even people who are on the battleground. And this is the physical, the military aspect. of the, this, this one man doing all this. That's why when we say Allah made him Rahmah, this Rahmah word is so broad that he was a mercy to every aspect of life. He, he opened the doors for learning. He made them so thirsty that the Sahabi was sent all the way to Syria to learn how to make weapons. He made them so thirsty about linguistics that one Sahabi learned the language in one month. He made them so thirsty about helping humanity that Abu Ayyub Ansari of the Allah who reaches the borders of Europe, he passes away, he writes down a will, not writes down, or he makes a will that move my body to the other side because on the day of judgment I want to be raised amongst the people who will travel all the way. He made them so thirsty to help others, that a lot of the lands which the Sahaba conquered, they conquered the land, whoever embraced Islam, you become the leader, you become the red, responsible person and they disappeared. You, to see the beauty of Islam, to see the beauty of reforming, go to Africa. A lot of people don't know, but one of the richest persons in the history of the world, according to the Western academics, is an African Muslim. I'm not sure who's his name, somebody remembers in the audience. But if you look at why and how that happened, you'll be shocked. These are the Anwarat. These are the 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 the, the, the it's the ripple effect of the nur of, of the ignition of what the Prophet ignited and brought to this world in terms of Rahma. His sahaba when he, they arrived in Persia, the Persians said, these guys are angels, we don't know how they got here. And when they went to anywhere in the world, whether they went to Indonesia, whether they went to China, or whether they went to you know, the, the, the Persian Gulf, all these regions, they brought stability, they brought an economic system which was so, so effective, that during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, this is all a contribution of the Prophet ﷺ. During the time of one of the biggest problems in economics today, this is why they have this. Europe, we just had a summit in uh, Switzerland last week, World Economic uh, Forum. Yes, we had a World Economic Forum, and 99 private jets arrived there. Then you can understand the logic there. 99 private jets arrived to discuss the world economic, uh, the world economic situation. The Prophet ﷺ changed the world's economy by 23 years of reforms. Because I tell you how the world's economy, America didn't exist those days, there was no people living there. During the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, this is post Umar, post Osman, all, all these years have passed, a lot of territory, two thirds of the world has come under Muslim rule, which is the majority of the world. They say, this is a historical fact, it's written down even in European, script, in European uh, history, history books. They say wealth had been distributed so effectively and so well that they could not find poor people anywhere in the Muslim world. And now they were worried what to do. They were worried money is being wasted. So they decided to send this money where? To the Europeans. Saying that there could be some poor people in Europe who may need this money. So, when we talk about Five of all five of these areas, each area in itself, there has been such an impact by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that only honest, honest, I'm not going to say God fearing, because if they were God fearing, they would be Muslims. Or they could be Muslims hidden inside, they may not express it openly. They say only 
honest academics of the West would tell you that. They would say to you that if it wasn't for the Prophet Muhammad, the entire Western civilization would have never reached where it is today. Rights, we talk about human rights, such rights. We talk about British values. You know this word about British values. The values which the Prophet ﷺ gave to the world are the values which made the world peaceful. You see, any value you have, one of the conditions for it to be a value is that it brings peace. If it does not bring peace, if it keeps people upset, it creates a mess in the NHS, it creates a mess, or it makes, it makes things expensive. For example, alcohol or drugs. Or let's use alcohol. They would say the human being has a right to enjoy themselves. Scientifically, it's proven alcohol causes a lot of diseases and it creates accidents. And I don't know, they say 55% or 60, 70% of the accidents in Britain are caused because of alcohol. That's a big number. If they really talk about statistics, then that should be enough to ban it. But now they're gradually, now they're working on public, they've done public transport, they've actually, Boris came in, first thing he did, he's banned drinking on, on, on trains and underground buses. The point I want to make, it's, if it's a value to be free, then where do, you cut, where do you put the limits? The Prophet ﷺ allowed the kuffar, in Islamic law, non-Muslims are allowed to drink. Sometimes Muslims, they misunderstand the seerah. This is the problem. They misunderstand what the Prophet ﷺ... You see, the problem is today, if you go to any scholar, he'll give you any flavor of Islam you want. Sadly. If it's to do with politics, you'll get one cultural Islam which has been transmitted. You know, they will say that there's Tawheed al hakimi and then Il Hukm Allah, everything's haram and everything's haram and just sit down. For the last 30 years, most of you are probably above 25, 30, we've seen everywhere in the Muslim world, every route has been used to bring, to bring reforms, as they say. The manhaj of the Prophet ﷺ is the only manhaj which Imam Malik rahimahullah says لَن يَصْلُحَ آخِرُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ إِلَّا بِمَا صَلُحَتْ بِهِ أَوْلُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ That this ummah cannot reach and remember we're not doomed people misunderstand this people think that Dajjal is coming and, the, and you know the world is coming to an end and for this reason you know it's all looking bad the other day somebody said to a scholar oh Qiyamah is coming and you know, just make dua, things are getting worse. The fitna are coming. But do we know that Isa alayhi salam, when he returns, the world will become heaven on earth? So should we just forget the effort made by the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and just put our hands down and say, you know what, it's too late, the Sahaba won another level and we, we today are miles away from them and let's just you know, do sabr and keep our limited flavored Islam. Or should we rather produce, and the word is, the correct pure Islam. You know, people use this word that there's there's an issue. There's there's an Islam which is called um, uh, you know um, Muslims who are extremists, but there's an Islam which is called non-violent Islam. I'm not sure if you heard this term, brothers. Non-violent Islam. It's a new terminology. Basically, what it is is it, they say that okay, it means you know they, they're trying to label everyone under different categories. So if my brother or sister is dying in another part of the world, according to the British values, we're supposed to stand up for it. But if a Muslim stands up for it, he ain't, he's not going to be in the UK for long. If he comes back from abroad, Gatwick Airport, Heathrow Airport, he will be arrested. If a British citizen goes and screams and shouts about, there was a country near Indonesia, a small island, I remember when I was abroad. T Timor, I think. Timor, yes. It was a Christian uh, community and they had a little island off Indonesia. And what they did is they, they screamed and shouted for some years and they were given an independent Christian country. If a Muslim does something, unfortunately, it's a threat to everything in the world. And we think, oh, because of this, we should get more frustrated. There's two ways people deal with this, sadly. The Prophet's method is that he did not create cowards. 
Muslims were not cowards. <coughs> Number two, he only compromised what Allah told him to compromise. He did not go beyond that. This is why it's important to know what the Prophet ﷺ did in that aspect. This is the problem which our youth, and I wanted to bring it to this final point when it comes to how do you, there's the Prophet ﷺ there, it's easy to talk about how good he was, how great he was. What's the biggest challenge is how do we relate to what he did to what we did today? Because no scholar is an ideal. It's a very, dangerous, it's a very powerful statement to say. But the true scholar will tell you that the ideal is only the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ's strategy was that between me and Allah, between me and you, me, you and Allah, I am not a medium. You go direct to Allah. This is the Islamic strategy. If you become an obstacle in between somebody's understanding of Islam, then you are unfortunately creating a confused picture. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to respect authority. He, his Sahaba, he said, are my, 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 my representatives and my deputies and they are the status of Ahlul Sunnah. That's why we get Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah from Ma'ana Alayhi wa Ashabi is where we get Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah from. To call this of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we all know, it comes from the statement Ma'ana Alayhi wa Ashabi. What I am upon and what my Ashabi meaning, the Alif of Abu Bakr until the Ya of Ali. The Sahaba did not say that you follow our way. And if you don't follow our way, um, they said, whose way do you follow? The Prophet's way. As long as every Sahabi is following the Prophet's manhaj, he is worthy of ittiba. As long as the Prophet is following what Allah has asked him to do, we do his ittiba. This is called this is called transparency. The other religions, you want a guideline on something, you go to the pandit, he opens a massive book. First of all, you can't read it, you're not allowed to touch it. You all know this very well, mashallah, in Britain we study other religions as well. If somebody even attempts to even read the book, he has offended the religion and he is punished. In other religions, the ones that are closer to Islam, Christianity and other religions, the first thing they have to struggle on is which version of the Bible or which thing do we have to follow. Then you have confusion in you know, scientific contradictions. Then you have this contradiction, that contradiction. In Islam, Aisha Allah says to the Prophet you just said this, but Allah says this with respect. The Prophet smiles and explains to her, it's in fact like this. Once Umar is giving khutbah, who is Umar? Umar is the one who shaitan runs away from. If this ummah had one more Umar, we would not be in this misery today. It's easy to say Umar, Umar and do these courses on Umar. But wallah, even if we knew the, the, the level of taqwa and the simplicity that this person had. On the one hand, he's so strong as a character that the vigilance Allah has given him. He used to close all the doors of shirk. He used to... I mean, he's, he's worried about an old lady in the middle of the night who doesn't have any food to eat. Which rule of today has even time to even look at that? I mean, they, we, we don't know what ideal mean. When we study the lives of these Sahaba, who were all nurtured by the Prophet So Umar ibn Khattab was giving a khutbah. I'm giving examples to explain to you what the Prophet ﷺ gave to the world. And hopefully I'm hopeful that this will give us, inspire us to understand. And we study more of this. You see the purpose of this halaqa, you're saying is fourth weekly, uh, every month, whatever you... And you know, I always request brothers to study and study more. Because every one of us is an ambassador of Islam. You can sit down with an academic and for hours you can actually make them understand what Islam really says. Omar is giving a khutbah, he's giving a khutbah and he wants to regulate on dowry. Big issue for our youth today, isn't it? The dowry issue. If he, did, if he applied that rule, we would be in big trouble today. He was trying to set a limit for maximum mahar. 
you can't, you know, we have a minimum mahar. There's a hadith which says that no mahar should be below 10 dirhams. So some scholars have taken that into account and said that there's a minimum for your mahar. The sunnah one is we follow either mahar of Fatimi or mahar of Aisha. Both are fa- valid, but mahar al Fatimi is the famous one. He was regulating on khutbah, he was about to announce a new legislation. Who is he giving the khutbah to? The people of Medina. Who is around him? The Sahaba and Sahabiyat, a woman. Think carefully, a woman on her own. What do we hear in the media about women in Islam? We hear they have no rights, they are abused. Some people are so backwards without any disrespect to them or their law. They say women drive is haram. And I'm not picking on any country. But if Aisha Dilla was riding on a camel, why can't a woman of today ride a car, drive a car? Is that not a logical question? If Aisha was on a camel on her own, what difference is it from a camel to a car? I don't see anything different apart from the fact that she's in fact more secure on a car than a camel. And you see this in the media. And the only thing you see about Sharia is chopping off heads. You see chopping off hands. And we're talking about all of this being attributed to who? The Prophet That's mainly for foreigners. Mainly for <laughs> foreigners as well. This is another issue. Our people always moan that all the hudud are applied on the, on the poor migrants who arrive in Saudi. The point I want to make is she's, he's giving a khutbah. This is Islam. These are Islamic values. I don't think even the president of today is allowed to, would allow someone to do that. I think there was a, somebody in Scotland, one of the, was it Scotland European president, of, he was giving a lecture, he was giving a public speech and somebody in the audience, uh, it's called heckling, they said something to him. So they took him away nicely in front of the cameras but then they fined him a lot of money. And they said to him, you basically um, offended this person and you know, you uh, dishonored him and you, it, they brought a law into action which is like you disturb the peace. So this lady stands up in front of Umar in the khutbah and he says to Umar, Ya Umar, how dare you make a set a limit for the maximum dowry? The Quran says this. What did Umar do? Did he get upset? What did he do with the great Umar? He melted in front of the ayah. He couldn't say nothing. Because of her words, a woman on her own got up and actually had this legislation. You know like you go to the house of commons and law gets passed. Like you've got that current anti-terrorism one going through the discussion. For it to get past, you have the final stage, you know, the different stages, and I'm not teaching a law lesson here. But the point I want to make is this is what the Prophet ﷺ gave to the world. He made the woman who was being buried alive, if she was born, become someone who is not only who not only has the right to own property who not only has the right to raise an objection, who not only has the right to inherit. Previously, they were not, most cultures of the world, they weren't allowed to inherit anything. It was not theirs. He gave this to the women of the world. He gave rights and responsibilities to all When we talk about rights, we sometimes think, okay, the rights are limited to husband, wife, or mother, father. He created a concept of rights in so many different aspects of life that if we were to write a book on the Islamic rights, it will far outweigh any book on human rights. I mean the animal, the Prophet said, if you are, if you are going to slaughter an animal, slaughter it in such a way that the animal doesn't get offended. <laughs> Don't show him the knife, hide it away. Make it sharp, because if it's blunt, the animal's going to die in suffocation. These, these are guidelines. Once one animal came and complained to the Prophet my master puts too much weight on me, doesn't feed me. He was given guidelines to give, to feed his animal, his own property. I mean, we're talking about if you, one Sahabi was building a wall next door to another Sahabi. His wall was affecting the daylight in the garden of the other Sahabi. The Prophet ﷺ asked him to take him into consideration. We're talking about environmental law. We're talking about another type of law. Somebody is selling their house. Their next door neighbor, subhanAllah, 
Their next door neighbor, they call it the yellow card, is it? Or the red card? <laughs> Sorry. So their next door neighbor uh, wants to buy the house. There's no law in this country that allows you, and anywhere in the world, Islamic law says. And this is all given to us by the Prophet. So the examples, of brothers, are endless. And I want to finish with what Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, similar circumstance. There was a poet, poet, a Jewish poet in Medina. He used to make fun of the Prophet. He used to make poems like the literature of today or the magazines and the cartoons and everything. We don't need to. Allah will protect the honor. Inna shaniya kahu al abtar. He doesn't need. The Prophet does not. Really, in all honesty, Allah has given him a status. The more they attack Islam, the more Muhammad becomes the most popular name in Europe. They get so sick and tired of hearing the word Muhammad. I said, why do you ask me questions about Muhammad, how to spell it? If you don't know how to spell Muhammad, you're not British anymore. And once I went somewhere, like, how do you spell Muhammad? Do you want it with the E? Do you want it with the O? Do you want it with the U? I'm like, relax, spell it how you want. It's Muhammad. Yes? But why? Why do we call ourselves Muhammad? I mean, in fact, they say a lot of Muslims are calling their children Muhammad now because in Muslim communities they live, they feel left out. Yes? May Allah make those Muhammads into Muslims. Yes? So the point is, Hassan ibn Sabit who was once a young Sahabi. What the Prophet gave to the youth? Oof. The majority of his Sahaba were youth. I see youth here today. This is the future of the Ummah. You guys are, mashallah, you know, talented, capable. Allah has blessed you with patience. These are things which we have to all take forward. Because our parents came before us, they did their job. They opened their masjids, they put us into mosques, and that's it. Now it's up to us. The Prophet ﷺ said, I have been helped the most by the youth, and I have been given the most problem by the elders. Yes? I don't think youth would disagree with that one in, today's, uh, in, in the wrong climax. Yes? So the Prophet Sallallahu when Hassan bin Sabit praises him, he says, and I'll finish off with this, he says, وَأَجْمَلَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَى قَدْتُ عَيْنِي No eyes have ever seen anyone as beautiful as you. وَأَجْمَلَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ No woman has given birth to anyone as beautiful as you. And then, خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّأً مِّن كُلِّ عَيْبٍ It's like Allah gave him a choice. On how you want to be created, and he gave him, it's as if, it's like a poem, and it's done by a Sahabi, so there's no shirk in this poem, in case somebody wonders. And I'm on camera there as well, I don't know how far that's gonna go. Yes? Sometimes you, you, you quote something and they're like, oh, that's haram. And it's like you do a video of a scholar somewhere, just underneath another scholar's having a go at him. What's happened to the Ummah? You have to be humble. If somebody says something, if he's got a basis behind it, you know, accept it. So, and then he says, Khulikta, it's like the way you've been created is as if you were created how you wanted to. And another, this is not a hadith, but it's a beautiful poem by someone about the Prophet. They say, Balagal ulabi kamalihi. That the Prophet reached the peaks with his with his achievements. Kashafa dujabi jamalihi. He took away and he took away the darkness through his light. And then he says, Sallu alayhi wa alihi. Therefore, send peace and blessings upon him and upon his family. And the reality is, brothers, may Allah give us the tawfiq to follow the Prophet ﷺ, to study the Prophet ﷺ, to know who the Prophet ﷺ is. May we all, Allah give us the tawfiq to send durood upon him you know, as much as we can, especially on Fridays, and become... Muslims who strike the balance between the extremes. To be extremely Muslim is what we want to be, not extreme. So being extremely Muslim simply means to be balanced. And if we follow the Prophet ﷺ, and there's no man in the history of the world whose life has been documented, preserved, in the way the Prophet's life has been preserved. I don't think anybody would know how many white hair, hairs they'd have on their beard. The Sahaba didn't even know. They knew how much the white hair was on the Prophet's beard. Anyone who says anything about the Prophet, we need to know his name, his family name, where he was born, is he reliable? From us to the Prophet, we've got a rich 1400 year plus history of data being preserved, being protected, being transmitted, 
That's why no Zayd, Bakr and Amr can say the Prophet ﷺ said something. If he said something, we will have so much data to open up that it will take him all day to figure out whether he really did say it. But what does this mean? If Allah has promised to protect the Qur'an, logically, indirectly, He has promised to protect the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, it would be impossible for me and you to follow the Prophet ﷺ. If we did not have all these ahadith, trust me, within 200 years, Muslims would have been finished. Anybody could have said anything. Look at other religions. But because we preserve the deen, as simple as it may look, it's powerful. It's full of nur. If me and you don't see the nur, we have to do istighfar and clean our hearts and do more dhikr. We will see the nur. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq, inshallah. I've been requested at least seven minutes ago. And I think we are out of time. Um, I will finish there and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq. Uh, to bring what was said in terms of bringing these things into our life and follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakumullah wa akhiru da'wan. Alhamdulillah.